So before I hand over to uh, to, to Shiv, um, this is where Michael Manelli would, would completely outshine me, but he's, he knows an awful lot more about everything. Uh, and as a, an alderman, a professor, uh, and uh, and soon to be sheriff of the Royal Mayor of London, he, uh, he'll probably spend 10 minutes talking about the subject. I'm not, I'm going to spend about a minute. My background, as I mentioned, is in investment banking uh, operations. I was uh, responsible or head of network manager at Morgan Stanley for many years and then moved to ZM where I ran surveys very often, funny enough, interviewing buy side firms on behalf of uh, the sell side firms. One or two of my clients and interviewees are, are here in the audience. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, I wasn't an expert in corporate actions by any stretch of the imagination, but worked closely, particularly when negotiating agent contracts with agent banks, with people who were. Um, Interestingly, I think, having seen what Shiv is going to talk about, uh, at the investment banks, we all knew in operations that the corporate actions was an incredibly complex and difficult and risky area. Um, really not very automated, bearing in mind I'm going back a long time, I'm, I'm much older than I look. Um, you tended to need expertise to run a corporate action area, but you would dread being given responsibility for it because it was pretty much one foot in the grave. Because there's just, you know, there's so much complication so little automation, so much risk and exposure if something went wrong um, that you know it was a huge, uh, it carried with it a very high profile. Lack of automation, as I said, lack of KPIs, uh, and yet significant risk, uh, so mistakes were, were very much highlighted. Um, in, on your seats, there's a very old document written by my old boss, Jeremy Smith. Um, and that's from a piece of work that we did in 2005 and was summarised in that article in 2006. The only reason we dug it out, because it is old and actually not very well written, if I'm honest, <laughs> now that we're looking at the standards we have nowadays. Um, but um, it is from the sell side, but a couple of things that jumped out uh, from that two or three page summary for me, having looked at what she's going to talk about, um, is that uh, you know, equities, first of all, was one of the biggest areas of exposure and the need for resources. This is back in 2005 and six. Uh, in terms of uh, the sell side's focus on, on corporate actions, uh, much less function, focus rather, sorry, in terms of uh, election and event management uh, than in the other areas of reconciliation and so on and so forth. And that any automation, uh, frankly, at the investment banks was typically built in house, and there were very few, if any, industry packages available to help people manage the incredibly complex world of, uh, of corporate actions. So. That was 15 years ago, I'm sure he was going to tell you from the buy side and elsewhere how that's changed completely. <laughs> uh, I hope, we'll see. And uh, with that in mind, um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Shiv. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, some things have changed in, from an automation perspective, but you'd be surprised how there are still quite a lot of legacy issues uh, and, and manual uh, processes involved, both in the buy side and sell side. And obviously, one of those problems is, is, a, is something that we are trying to solve uh, as a technology company uh, in the financial services industry. Um, I want to go through a quick agenda of what we're going to talk about. We'd like to give you an introduction uh, to the problem that we're trying to highlight and also how uh, we came our genesis as a company to come together to try and solve that. A uh, brief overview of voluntary corporate actions and a recent example to highlight the problem and what kind of magnitude we're talking about. Uh, that leads well into the total misvalue just in script dividends. Uh, obviously that's just one part of the overall corporate event uh, universe and probably the most vanilla one. So the fact that there is such a large magnitude of uh, value missed even on the most vanilla corporate action, so it highlights how much more there is in the more complex bit. Um, we delve into why the money is being lost. Uh, there are a myriad of reasons that I'll run through with you. Uh, and finally, uh, we run into some of the dangers that are uh, coming up for asset managers for ignoring this problem, including uh, a recent white paper that came out of the States. Uh, basically saying there's potentially a case for, for litigation against people not managing the corporate actions problem. So, the introduction to the program, um, to the problem. 
Uh, Scorpio was genesis of four founding partners coming together from a history, more on the investment banking side, uh, but all involved in corporate actions. So ranging all the way from trading to securities lending to back office um, and middle office involved in the corporate action space. What we realized whilst we were at the investment bank was that there is a, a large inefficiency within the uh, within the market surrounding corporate actions. And historically, <coughs> that inefficiency of, of investors mis-selecting was arbitraged by the investment banks using uh, securities lending as a route to access securities. Uh, what we realized whilst we were there at those banks, that of the global asset base, only about 20 to 25% is within the securities lending pool. And in effect, there's 70 to 70 say 75% of securities that are not getting any value at all around these corporate actions. And so we set out to start a company to provide a solution to all of those investors who are not necessarily focused on corporate actions and may not even realize that there is a value that's embedded within their portfolios that they're missing. Since we've started, we've done uh, analysis going back to 2011 on try and calculate exactly what the magnitude of the problem is. And within the script dividend space alone, again, as we mentioned, that's only a part of the overall corporate event space, more than a billion dollars is lost every single year by people mis-selecting on the most vanilla of corporate actions. And so over $9 billion has been lost since 2011. And what we also see is that the number of people who are uh, electing suboptimally has not actually changed much. So the numbers vary quite a lot per year, but what's fairly consistent is the percentage of people who are continuously electing suboptimally. Uh, the problem is one that is actually quite well known within the asset management industry, uh, because obviously some people look to get some optimization by securities lending, but it is also something that we've been trying to highlight and other industry participants as well for quite a few years. The issue is that there is not necessarily the right amount of transparency from there down to the beneficial owners. So the pension funds, the investors, the pension trustees don't necessarily have enough information about just how much value is being missed from the portfolios that they are invested in. And that's one of the key reasons why we are here right now trying to highlight the problem. And we also work very closely with Andy at the Transparency Task Force just to get this problem out there so people realize that there is additional value to be captured within portfolios that they are already invested in. Uh, and then finally, in as I mentioned earlier, in at the end of November 2017, a uh, very reputable US law firm, uh, Greenberg Traurig and Berkeley Research, were commissioned for white paper by us <coughs> because we were looking to you know, highlight this problem to people and we were getting quite limited traction, so we wanted to know really what the, you know, is it a very serious problem? Is it something that the asset management industry has a fiduciary responsibility towards the underlying beneficial <coughs> owners? Is there something that, is it something that they could potentially be sued for? Is there a litigation chances that they don't necessarily know about? Uh, and so the answer to all of those, those questions that turned out by analysis from the independent law firm was yes. And they, they go into quite a lot of detail about exactly why that is the case. And the asset managers have a fiduciary responsibility to the underlying investors. So we wanted to also highlight that fact so that people in the industry know that there is a potential problem coming up and they need to solve for it right now, and either by putting in processes and controls to stop that value being missed themselves, or by using technologies such as services that we provide. But you know, whatever solution they choose, the, the point is that they need to figure out what the solution is for their own individual circumstances. So when we talk about voluntary corporate actions, what are we talking about? We're talking about corporate events where, as a shareholder, you have a right to choose between various options that a company provides you. And at the point of making that election, making that choice, each option can attribute an economic value to each option, and therefore one of those options is the optimal election. And so we're not talking about events where 
there is still a choice, but you may not necessarily know the outcome. We're talking specifically about the space where, as a shareholder, you know what the value of each outcome is, and so you should be in a position to choose correctly. So <clears throat> events that fall within that category are script dividends, which is the one that we're going to try and focus on today because it tends to be the most vanilla of, of all the corporate events, but it goes on to rights issues, tender offers, even you know, cross-border takeovers. The complexity <coughs> increases, but the underlying principle is basically the same. You still have two or three or four choices, and one of those choices is economically optimal above the others. Um, so the easiest and most vanilla of, this, uh, of these are script dividends. And essentially, all that script dividend is, is when an issuer, uh, a company, rather than just giving you a cash dividend, actually gives you, as a shareholder, the option to reinvest that cash in a new share that they issue. So as a shareholder, you can either receive your dividend in cash, or you receive an equivalent amount of shares. But that equivalent amount of share, that price is set today. So if we go through like a very basic example, if a company announces a dividend of one pound, for example, and uh, the share price of the company at the point of making that election, uh, making that announcement is ten pounds. If, as a shareholder, you own, owned ten shares, then you can receive effectively ten pounds in cash as a dividend. Or the company says you could also receive one share because they announced that today. But the key thing is, you don't make that decision until normally a few weeks to one month from now. And clearly, in that one month period, the value of that one share that you are entitled to varies. And so at the point of making the election, if that price of that share, for example, has gone up to 11 pounds, then as a shareholder, my choices are still the same. I receive either 10 pounds in cash or one new share. That one new share, however, is now worth £11. And so the optimal election, the right thing to do as a shareholder, is to elect for stock. And you can either keep the stock in your portfolio, you can immediately sell it so that you're locking in the additional £1 that's being generated if you just wanted cash as your yield. But the key point is, the economically optimal thing to do is to elect for the share. And what we basically found is that in in, you know, the other thing that happens in script dividends is there's normally a default option. So if as a shareholder you do nothing, then one of those two options is the default. And in the majority of markets, that tends to be cash. So if as a shareholder you do absolutely nothing, the company just gives you the cash dividend. Uh, we've also seen a lot of people, um, a lot of asset managers who, you know, are looking at passive index indexes and stuff, and they don't really concentrate on corporate actions. And, for them to track the index, for example, they just need to receive the cash dividend. So they put a standing order that said to, to their custodian that says, I would just like a cash dividend. Now obviously, what happens in that instance is that a lot of them are not even looking at the potential value in the other option. And so, in any of those instances where a shareholder goes for default or has a standing instruction, they are potentially missing a lot of the value that could be in the other option. And that's basically, the problem that we're trying to highlight. And within just that circumstance, a huge amount of money is being missed. So let me run through a very recent example. National Grid, big UK company, paid a, uh, a dividend which went X in May and paid in August. It also had the script option to that I mentioned earlier. Now the dividend amount was 31.26 pence. And the reinvestment price when they announced it, so the price of natural grid at that point in time was £7.8974. The price on the election deadline, and we put election deadline minus two because most investors uh, are given a deadline a couple of days before the market deadline by the custodians to actually make the election deadline. So that should be the, the relevant reference date to decide which way you go for. The price on that deadline was £8.379. £8 so, it was 0.4816 in the money at that point, the stock collection. Despite the fact that it was so far in the money, 55% of all shareholders of National Grid elected for cash anyways. On that stock, that is a 24 basis points of absolute outperformance just on that one name, on that one event. So, you know, 
across the whole market just on that one event, one script event in one market, 39 million pounds was, was the value missed on that. So it really highlights the, the kind of the size of the problem that's out there. To look at it overall, when you look across all script events globally, this is the, the kind of magnitude of the problem we're talking about. It is, as, as I mentioned earlier, over a billion dollars on average every single year in the most vanilla of all the corporate events. And what we've also seen actually is, even though the numbers are varying quite a bit up and, up and down, that has a correlation to what the share price of the stock does in between the announcement bid and the election. And what I mean by that is that, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people have a default option or a standing instruction for cash on their portfolios. What that means is, if between the announcement of the, the investment price and when you elect, if the price comes off, then naturally cash is the optimal election. So people who are not actually actively tracking that election are getting it right just by luck, basically. <coughs> so what we so in this in the years where you see, for example, 2018 was a much lower missed value number than a couple of years before. If you actually look at the percentage of people who are electing suboptimally, that doesn't actually change. So in situations, for example, the UK market where in the UK, uh, where stock was a more optimal election compared to cash. 80% of people were still getting it wrong in 2018. 80%. And that's been fairly consistent throughout the years. You know, it varies from 70 to 80% of people are getting that, that election wrong consistently year on year. So it just shows that even though we, we, you know, there was obviously greater focus on it, there hasn't yet been a change in behavior from the investor, investor perspective. Uh, we also, you know, stuff on the research that they did with the Berkeley Group, they also tried to compare uh, a subset of asset managers' elections to the market overall. And astonishingly, what they found was actually the asset managers underperform the market overall in terms of the election, which is, you know, it's crazy when you, when you think about it. Now, we need to delve into you know, why is this money being lost. As I, you know, some of the points I alluded to earlier, if you were a big portfolio manager or focus specific on very specific strategies or you're an index tracker, corporate actions may not necessarily be your, your main area of focus, they may not be on your radar. What we've also seen is that it can sometimes not be <coughs> huge amounts of money per event. And so, you know, we, we did analysis, for example, for, for a very large asset management firm, they sent over a portfolio, and I think the value missed on that portfolio over, over the year was only like $30,000. And that's basically what they said, it's like this is $30,000, know, why would we engage in, in this and look into further? And then we said, well actually that's just one portfolio. And their overall company had you know, more than 20,000 portfolios being offered. And so the magnitude when you look at it from the overall company is huge. It may not be a lot to the individual portfolio manager. This is why it's key that the solution has to be technology-based, so it's scalable. Because you don't want individual, you know, the way that our solution works, for example, is that the portfolio manager doesn't change his behavior at all. They elect like they do today. If they get it right, perfect, they get all the value of it. If they don't, our technology acts as a safety net. So that basically, in the event that they don't, it still does the right thing to extract that value. That's clearly just an example of our technology, but firms who are worried about this need to have some kind of procedural control in place to make sure that they aren't in the situation where individual portfolio managers may miss a little bit, but for the company overall, it's a huge amount of money to miss. So you know, one of the examples that we give there is that there are 130 global scripts annually and if each manager just misses $1,000 per event, and there are 100 managers, that's $13 million across the company that's being lost. And you know, it may seem like breadcrumbs for the individual managers, but it really adds up. And in this age when there's, there's so much focus on costs, on providing the best value for your individual <coughs> investors, it's just not possible to ignore 
these kinds of sums of money. Um, so, you know, you may think, okay, this problem is so clear, and you guys provide a technological solution that's risk free, and they only have upside. What are the reactions you've had? These are some of the answers that we've had from, from people who we've tried to give our technology to. Um, you know, one of the asset managers we went to were losing money in the tens of millions, and they said they were comfortable with that, and their focus at that time was on something else. Our traders did not want to do anything, and you know, possibly the most ludicrous was that 13 million is less than our CEO gets paid, <laughs> and so we'll not get him interested. Uh, 13 million is not enough to turn the dial. Um, yeah, we were rather flabbergasted by that. Uh, now, you know, for, for, for a company uh, which, which manages billions, sometimes trillions of dollars, you know, 13 million may not seem like a large amount, but for their underlying investors, many of whom are pension funds who are catering to a much longer investment time frame, <coughs> that money is key. We see all this information, you know, news right now about pension deficits and what a huge issue that's turning out to be. If we take that 13 million as an example, if that 13 million we missed today, or if you look back at 40 years, was invested in the S&P, over the last 40 years, that would be worth $4.4 billion today. And so that is, you know, over the investment time frame, that is the magnitude that we're talking about. And that's why if you want to plug your pension deficit where you're underfunded, it's not something that you do at the end when your liabilities are coming up. You need to get every single cost, every single dollar of revenue that you can earn right now. Um, and, you know, which is finally why we also think that in reality, the only way this, this changes is if the regulator steps in and, and sees that the value is missing and sets up proper controls and realizes that actually you do need a technological solution, whether it's something they build in house, whether they use outsource providers <coughs> to ourselves. The key thing is for the beneficial owners that they are receiving the value that they are entitled to. It's already embedded in their portfolio. So next up in is uh, Andy. Um, so Andy, if you'd like to come up, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for giving me a chance to talk about this particular topic. Uh, and the reason I'm keen to talk about it is that, to my mind, it's an extremely good example of some of the underlying issues within the financial services sector that cause all sorts of problems for us at an individual level and at an industry level. And I think you've already heard enough to realize there are some fundamental problems that clearly still do exist. And if allowed to continue, will continue to cause the kind of reputational damage the industry as a whole, that none of us want, and none of us, frankly, should be willing to tolerate. Just thinking about it for a minute, this is the kind of problem that could potentially end up in the newspapers. This is the kind of problem that could potentially cause a whole load of adverse publicity. Why? Because, frankly, the beneficial owners are not being cared for properly enough. It's a simple and as straightforward as that. And my proposition, my offering, my suggestion is that we should try to do a better job collectively to understand what these underlying issues are, to have some really honest conversations with each other about how we've got to where we are and what needs to change to make it better. Because this is just one example of, frankly, dozens and dozens and dozens of suboptimal outcomes being created within the financial services sector that collectively are causing us some, some pretty big issues. So this is something I personally take very, very seriously indeed. Transparency. Um, what I'd now do in my 
working time. It is not something I plan to do. I've kind of accidentally become a campaigner for reform within the financial services sector. This is not a career path decision. It's just something that's come about as a consequence of extreme frustration over 30 years looking at how the industry works and how it can sometimes has a predisposition to shortchange the consumer, which is a bad thing. And I personally believe that there is a correlation between transparency and truthfulness and trustworthiness. In other words, if you have a system that is fundamentally more transparent, it will bring about more truthfulness, and that truthfulness is a prerequisite for the trustworthiness that we desperately, desperately need to regain. So take a look at this. What you're looking at there is, I think, pretty worrying. In case you're not familiar with the Edelman Trust Barometer, it's a seriously credible, huge piece of annual research involving something like 30,000 respondents around the world. And it goes into all sorts of detail. But the fundamental point is that it ranks the levels of trustworthiness across different industry sectors. And the shocking outcome pretty much year in, year out, is that banking and financial services is routinely bottom. Now, that in and of itself is an issue. But when we think that financial services has to be trustworthy to function successfully, I'm going to repeat that, has to be trustworthy to function successfully, this is a systemic problem. This is something we should kind of all be jumping up and down about and saying this just isn't good enough. We need to do something. The word credit stems from the Latin credere, which actually means belief in. The entire financial services sector is built upon the idea of having the potential to believe in stuff. And you can't believe in things if you don't trust it. So when I first started looking at this data a few years ago, I started asking myself, what, what is this, what's causing this? But more importantly, who's doing something about it? What is the master plan amongst policymakers, politicians, regulators, trade bodies, professional associations, to look at this as a pan-industry issue that needs to be managed? So let's think about it. We have something which I would argue, at length, is a systemic issue for the financial services sector, with all sorts of downside consequences. The only logical outcome would be, you would think, some very clever people somewhere are working together to manage this problem through. But it's not happening. There isn't a plan in place to try to manage the situation. There's a great Mark Carney quote. He, uh, he used it in the context of the B word. Forget that thing. Right? <laughs> I won't upset the line. <clears throat> but the quote is, plan beats no plan. So when I and some others started to think, there's something seriously wrong here, but there's nobody doing anything about it, we thought, okay, we're not particularly clever people, and it's pretty likely that the plan we come up with isn't going to be particularly good. But it's going to be better than no plan. And at least the process of trying to bring together policymakers, politicians, regulators, trade bodies, professional associations, think tanks, etc., 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 will hopefully encourage others to do exactly the same. So that's the journey that I've been on over the last four and a half years or so. And quite honestly, the more I learn about the root causes that are causing that, the more concerned I get. Because what you're hearing about in relation to Scorpio, I promise you, is just one of so, so, so many suboptimal situations. What you're looking at, that kind of strange picture, is a 12-headed hydra. I'll explain now, if I can, why you're looking at a picture of a 12-headed hydra. 
We, within the Transparency Task Force, have uh, 22 special interest groups covering topics such as foreign exchange, banking, asset management, pensions, private equity hedge funds, etc., etc., etc. And we have conference calls, we have meetings, and I'm involved with everything. So over the last four and a half years, I've had God knows how many hours worth of conversation and dialogue with people about the issues within those 22 different special interest groups. And I'm really not a very clever person, you probably gave them that already, but even I can start to see some common generic issues that were coming up. Yeah, they were coming up in foreign exchange, and yes, they were coming up in banking, and yes, they were coming up in asset management pensions, but essentially, the issues were kind of generic in nature. And over a long period of time, I kind of concluded that there were 12 basic problems in life. And to cut a very long, I think quite interesting story short, we started to realize that to deal with the problem, we had to have what we describe as a whole system solution to a whole system problem. So just dealing with one of those issues won't work. The 12-headed hydra is there because of the idea that you can't defeat it by just chopping off one or two or three of the heads. I've kind of grown back if you understand my metaphor, if that's the right word. We need to take the whole thing out. In other words, we need to deal with the whole system issues that are at work. The approach we are advocating is that this approach needs to be pretty systemic and it needs to be pretty systematic. And what's happened, to cut this long, interesting story short, is that there are now 850 something people around the world, quite literally, UK, Europe, Australia, North America, Canada, Hong Kong, Singapore, etc., who are working collectively and with and through me to create what we are describing as a framework for finance reform. It's a bold, brave, ambitious attempt to take on that 12 page monster. And we're doing it by building what we call the Finance Development Goals. Many of you, I'm sure, will be very familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They deal with things like poverty, climate change, access to clean drinking water, etc. We're dealing with those 12 heads on that monster. Issues such as governance. Issues such as lack of transparency, issues such as conflicts of interest, issues such as problems caused by incentives that almost encourage malpractice. So those are the 12 finance development goals. And the reason I'm very, very pleased to be speaking here today <coughs> is that when I kind of overlay the 12 finance development goals, the 12 problem areas, the 12 heads on that monster, when I kind of overlay that, in relation to the problems that Scorpio talked about, I find that many of them, all the ones in red, are there somewhere in the Scorpio story. And that's why I really like talking about the Scorpio situation, because it just gives me a great platform to describe some of the issues that we have. I'll talk about a few of them. Are we still okay for time? Just to check. Absolutely. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm happy to take any comments or questions on the way, and survey challenges as well. Virtuous leadership. That's one of the finance development goals, because frankly, we think that one of the basic problems we have is there isn't enough of virtuous leadership. In other words, leaders within the industry who have a principle before profit mindset, who have a morals before money mindset. Now, I know this is sounding a bit preachy, right? I get that. But fundamentally, there are too many people with too much influence who put short-term gain above other things. I was so excited last week when the business roundtable in the US came up with that thing about we need a multi-stakeholder approach or a shareholder primacy approach. Because I think that's the way forward. I think there are serious issues around the tragedy of the commons. You'll be familiar with that concept, I'm sure. The idea that if everybody looks after their own short-term interest, we're all knackered, eventually. I believe that to be true. I might be naive, I might be simplistic, but I really believe that to be true. So for me, lady and gentlemen, we need to fix that, by the way. Another conversation, right? Another conversation. There's a really important part to play about virtuous leadership. We're talking to organizations that recruit for major roles in financial services positions 
who are using things like moral quotients. What a brilliant idea. We all know about IQ, we all know about EQ, NQ, moral quotients. Regulators around the world are starting to realize that if the lady or gent at the top of the organization has a high NQ, that organization is far less likely to be crashed on the rocks through scandals. Think about what's been happening recently with Vols Fargo, etc., etc., etc. So virtual leadership is really important. The reason I contextualize it with the emergence of Scorpio is that it's I, and I'm sure if you were a leader of an asset management firm, and if you were virtuous, you'd say, I don't care if the numbers aren't really that big. It's wrong. You know? A pension scheme is like a bucket of water. These buckets of water put loads of holes in them, loads. We need to plug up every one of those holes, otherwise we just lose the value. Scorpio is an opportunity to plug up one of those holes, and there are effectively people saying, people, not my money, why should I care? That's kind of wrong, isn't it? So that's why the leadership one is there. The culture one are pretty obvious. If I had an organization looking after my interests that displayed the kind of culture displayed in some of the feedback that Shiv just showed us, my immediate thoughts would be, what else don't they care about? Transparency, damn obvious. It's probably just a matter of time before this issue ends up in the newspapers. Because eventually, if things default towards transparency, the truth eventually gets out. What we've got now is an opportunity to collectively manage the situation so it doesn't end up in the newspapers, so we can actually deliver value for money and plug in these holes in this bucket that's leaking water. That's the right and intelligent thing to do. And part of the problem is knowing who has the problem. We'll talk about that later in the Q&A session. I'll be really keen to hear your thoughts around a very specific question. For who is this issue a problem? That would be interesting. Evidence based. The evidence shows mathematically, financially, there's a whole load of subordinality going on here. Yeah, we're not talking about conjecture, we're not talking about uh, bias, we're talking about hard cash. Governing well, we're clearly not governing well in most of the issues you've been uh, hearing about tonight. Communicating authentically. Um, is there an inherent responsibility for us to tell people that they may be making the wrong decision? I think there probably is. Are we not communicating authentically by not telling them that? I think that might be the case. Acting with purposefulness. That particular finance development goal is all about the idea that there's potential for the world's capital markets to become a force for good, a force for good through things like responsible investing, impact investing, ESG, so on and so forth. Acting with purposefulness is a really good and really cool thing to do when you can. <coughs> I would suggest that what Scorpio are shining a light on suggests that there's perhaps not as much purposefulness in this particular area as there could and should be. Incentivize responsibly. There's a wonderful Charlie Munger quote. Every one of our finance development goals has a quotation attached to it just to bring the idea to life so people really understand it. The Charlie Munger quote, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's right hand man partner. Uh, the quote, I love this quote. It, it kind of, there's a lifetime of wisdom in just a few words. Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. That's really powerful. It's basically saying that what happens is a function of what the incentives say will happen. I love that quote, and it's so true. I've been in this sector for 30 years, pretty much all my working life. I can trace most of the headaches we've had in this industry, the sorts of things that have caused all of us significant reputational damage. I can trace so many of them back to an incentives issue of some kind. Here, perhaps the issue is, Who's incentivized to look after beneficial owner? So I'll leave that question hanging, we'll pick it up in the QA. Protecting consumers from harm, we go on and on about this, but in a nutshell, um, if we're not doing what we can to look after the customer, the 
best of our ability. <coughs> We're not protecting them from harm. Do we deserve the business? I know this is a very, very simplistic way of looking at it, but I genuinely believe this is the way our sector needs to begin to think. I'm going to correct myself. I personally think we used to think this way. Gary and I and some others were having an interesting conversation earlier. You know, this, the, the behaviour within this industry has changed significantly since the Big Bang. Maybe these are issues we can talk about in the Q&A. What have been the fundamental impacts of walking away from, from things like general, practice, general partner liabilities, etc., etc. Maybe things like the senior managers regime, etc., are an attempt to bring some of that personal responsibility back, but will they be as effective? So incentives have a big part of play in it. Protecting consumers from harm has a big part of play in it. Managing risk properly has a big part of play in it all. So I want to thank Zied for giving me the chance to preach a little bit. Hope it hasn't been too preachy, okay? Um, a chance to thank, frankly endorse what Scorpio are doing. But believe me, the issue Scorpio are raising awareness of is one of dozens and dozens that we're trying to tackle head on. Some of them are even worse. So my conclusion is this. I would like to think that all the relevant stakeholders, policymakers, politicians, trade bodies, associations, if anybody here is in a position of influence within a trade body or a professional association, please do the right thing and pick up on this. Yeah, please, please, please do the right thing and pick up on this. Whether you're doing that for altruistic reasons or you just want to protect your members from the court case in decades to come, who cares? Do the right thing anyway. So, we should give this matter some pretty urgent attention, and I will always argue we should try to understand what the underlying drivers of this behaviour are. Because the one thing we all have in common <coughs> is that we're all human beings, driven by human being drivers, which may uh, pressure us to achieve targets, objectives, and all those other human things. So we have to recognise that there's a lack of appreciation of the humanity within the financial ecosystem. And how as a consequence of that, we are all, including myself, vulnerable to forces that sometimes encourage a predisposition to not do the right thing. I'm definitely not saying I'm any better or, or anything like that than anybody else. I'm definitely not. Yeah, I'm just happy to rest of the rest of this. With that, I'll close the talk. Thank you.